Hi, good afternoon. Roy Oppenheim here for Oppenheim Law. We're again here at Zoom at noon. For those of you who've joined us before, you may know the format by now. This is the 10th time that we're holding 10 weeks in a row, Zoom at noon, since the COVID-19 crisis has basically changed everyone's lives and turned all our lives literally upside down and in some cases even, even inside out. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the three tenets of safely going back to business, liability insurance, and asset protection. As usual, I, I wanna thank uh, Paula Vergara, Ellen Pulowski, my wife, partner, uh, and Jeff Sherman, my partner, and of course, uh, Lance Oppenheim, who's been assisting us, and even Wendy Oppenheim today, who's assisting us with, with this presentation, and, and Mia Singh, my, my associate. Uh, all of us work together to put these presentations together for you each and every week, trying to figure out what the latest trends are, what's going on, trying just getting a little bit around the bend, around the curve, so we can figure out what, what's, what's coming and, and what's happened in the past so we can figure out how to conduct ourselves in such a way that we can remain safe as well as productive uh, as we proceed through this whole crisis. Um, things are starting to open up, we all know that, and so we have to figure out how we're gonna navigate this process in terms of our own personal safety, our employees' safety, our customers' safety, and, and trying to figure out how we do this in a way that we move forward and not backwards, individually and as a society. So going back to business as safe as it can, uh, weekly unemployment and, and crisis status update, travel and hospitality industry, retail spaces, schools and colleges, revised CDC guidelines, liability, insurance, and number eight, asset protection. Uh, this is a continuation, actually, of last week's uh, webinar. For those of you who had joined us, there are many areas that we were unable to touch. And of course, I also want to mention that, that Ken Morris of South, Southeast uh, Group is joining us again today, Southeast Morris Group, who is going to, uh, once again, be participating and assisting us in, in this process. We can go to the next slide. Um, let me just briefly remind those of you how this all works. We uh, look for participation, we look for comments, we look for criticism, we look for questions through this whole process. It's kind of hard to, to run this without any true interaction from you, the community. And so when you have something to say, please say it, and if possible, we will in integrate it. If it's a good question, obviously, we're gonna try and answer it. And if it's a very personal question, we'll try and answer it afterwards if it's something that you don't want the whole world to know about. As you all may know, or by now, we've been in practice for over 31 years. Uh, Ellen and I formed this firm. We went through the last crisis and, and represent thousands of people during the foreclosure crisis. And again, we are now representing hundreds of people who are trying to figure out what to do with their leases, what to do as a landlord, what to do as a tenant, what to do if they can't pay their mortgage, and, and if they have a business, you know, how to navigate that through the various government programs that exist out there and to figure out how that integrates with, with, with their, their business. Uh, as I mentioned, Ken's gonna be joining us. He's been also practicing for over 30 years. He's with the Morris Southeast Group and a full service commercial real estate firm. This is the third week that Ken will be joining us today. So let us get going if we may. Our last session was a discussion about the best practices businesses must implement to avoid liability on the reopening process. This week, we will further our analysis on the three tenets of going back to business, uh, liability, insurance, and asset protection. And when we talk about liability, we're talking about what the best practices are as an employer or even as an employee and what we need to do to shield ourselves from later on being questioned if we did the right thing and if we protected our employers, employees, did we protect our customers, did we protect our vendors, or were we doing something that was just far afield and wasn't reasonable and is gonna open us for exposure. So the idea is to figure out what the best practices are, what we all should be doing, that's reasonable, that will allow us to proceed uh, as, as a society. Uh, can I go back one? Sorry. Uh, I want to mention what, what Jeffrey Sachs, director of, of Center for Sustainable Development, has said at Columbia University. By being uh, smart, I can't read that, the picture's in the way. Uh, by being smart and fair, we could look forward to new high-tech industries, more shared leisure time, shorter commutes, cleaner skies, universal access to affordable health care, and higher education and a guaranteed living wage for all workers. That's, that's wonderful. It sounds utopian, but, but there will be changes that come out of this. Uh, Typically, out of these kinds of crises, out of these pandemics, many wonderful things came about historically. For example, good sanitation, uh, sewage systems, delivery of, of potable water uh, through, through municipalities are all things that came out of the various pandemics that, that we have had as, as through humanity. And so good will come out of this. The question is what good will come out of it? If we see the pictures of India and other parts of China and other parts of the United States, like Los Angeles, and how the cleaner skies 
are, are, are proceeding. We're seeing that there will be some benefit that comes out of this. At this time, of course, we're not sure what those will be. Okay, let's go over the unemployment numbers because they, they are rather staggering. As we can see, they were rather low before uh, the month of April, uh, uh, up through 2020, through April of this past year. And then, of course, they, in April, they shot up, and then they shot up through all of April. Now they're slightly coming down. That's the number of people filing. The reason they're coming down is because so many people are already unemployed, 36 million. Also, it's because many of the systems that, that take the unemployment uh, applications have not been successful in filing the claims. In particular, in Florida, there's been huge criticism uh, in terms of, of people not getting paid who have filed their claims as, as early as March or even April. And that could become a huge crisis in terms of landlord-tenant relations if, if that problem is not fixed and not fixed soon. I want to talk a little bit about where people are going from New York because these migrations are going to affect many things. It's going to affect uh, the economies long term. It's going to affect politics. Uh, for example, uh, you're seeing that one of the major places that folks from the Northeast are coming is Florida. The question is, are they going to bring the virus with them? Are they going to quarantine? Uh, what impact is this going to have on the real estate market? What impact is it going to have on the real estate market in New York versus in, in Florida, uh, and and those are the types of things that we're going to see. It's also going to see, you know, how many people are going to register to vote and become permanent and not go back. Uh, those are the kinds of questions that that these kinds of pandemics have that 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 can be uh, long term and and have tremendous implications. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the stock market. What we're seeing is that certain stocks right now are starting uh, to actually go up. The S and P five hundred, for example was not doing as well as, as some of the stay-at-home stocks, uh, but now we're seeing that, that folks are starting to think that because we're opening up, companies that maybe weren't doing as well are gonna be able uh, to do better. For example, if we go to the next slide, we'll see that, that uh, Peloton, which was doing really well because it's stay-at-home stock, same thing with Netflix, it are not necessarily doing as well. Activision Blizzard, the same thing. Grubhub probably will continue to do well regardless. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, Zoom you know, has, has been dropping a little bit, even though many folks will continue to use it regardless. Uh, Slack, kind of the same thing. Let's go to the next one, if we may. And then we're seeing that the airline stocks are starting to take off again, even though they were they were doing very poorly because the sense is that people may feel comfortable to start flying again at some point uh, in, in the future. Um, next slide. Uh, and let's talk about hotel stocks real quickly. We have the same thing here. There's certain hotel stocks, while they were 90, 95% off, they're starting to see increases in in, in uh, reservations. And so to that extent, we're seeing that, that those stocks also may, may start to do better than than they have in the past. And that's a reflection of, of that thing, that there's hope and anticipation that things are going to get better. Um, of course, as we've talked about in previous slides, we're not sure if there's gonna be a double dip or even a triple dip. And of course, that all has to do with how quickly the vaccines are, are gonna proliferate or to the extent that, that we hit herd immunity and that, and that we have many people with, with the antibodies. There are studies coming out right now that are suggesting that people with the antibodies are in fact gonna be immune from, from getting the disease for a period of time. The question is we don't know how long because those people haven't had the, the antibodies for, for a long enough period yet. And I say the word yet. Next. Uh, I'm gonna bring Ken in now if we can. Uh, Ken, are you there? We're gonna talk about travel and hospitality. Are you there, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect, perfect. Uh, if you wanna take over for a little bit, I'd love you to do that. We're on page slide 15 or 16, thank you. Sure, uh, well, you know, again, clean hotel rooms is where it's at. If you're going to get people out and who are going to travel, the first thing they're going to be concerned about is safety. Uh, I think the hotel industry for the next 12 to 18 months is really in trouble. Uh, one of the things that the hotel industry has to be concerned about is uh, the amount of debt in the system and how, what debt they have. So we're talking about seamless entry, uh, touchless services, uh, try not to talk to anybody or get coughed on by anybody. Uh, hotel amenities are going to completely change. Uh, but back to the debt, it, it's CMBS debt, commercial mortgage-backed security debt. They're already in trouble because most of these uh, hotels, a lot of them have CMBS financing, which means there's no one to talk to. If you want to get a deferment, there is no deferment. It goes into special servicing. So expect a wave of special servicing. Uh, and foreclosures in the hotel market over the next 12 to 18 months, unfortunately. You know, one thing I just want to mention is, is I, I read this morning that Starbucks has asked their landlords for basically a 12-month reprieve on rent. No one is saying how, how big the reprieve is, but they're basically saying that they're not going to be able to cover their, their, their rental costs for, for, for the next 12 months. And maybe they're, they, no one knows 
what the request is, but it was an across the board request to virtually every landlord in the country that has a Starbucks. And there are a lot of Starbucks in the, in the country. Yeah, it was all the company owned, it was all the company owned stores. And I, I think it's gonna backfire on them. I understand the concern, but you know, I think it's gonna hurt their brand. Uh, many of the stores are, are high performers, they do very well, and you know, it's very hard to pay five bucks for a latte, whatever you want to call it, because I don't go to Starbucks, but and, and then ask the landlords, you know, to give them a break. So I think it's uh, the jury is going to be out a little bit to see how that plays out for Starbucks. A lot of their stores are single user buildings that were built specifically for Starbucks. So I think they're trying to twist the arms of the triple net lease asset landlords that they do business with across the country. I agree with that. It's not gonna be a good picture. Uh, two things I wanna mention. One is uh, for those folks who haven't been on these webinars before, all the old webinars are on our website. They're all on YouTube. They're all there. You, you don't have to write everything down. You can, you can capture it all whenever you want. And, and I know there's a lot of, lot of dense in, information here. I wanna go to the first question, Ken. Uh, if we can, uh, and the first question is about hotels and Airbnbs. Can I read the question? Okay. If you plan on traveling this summer, are you uh, more apt to stay at a hotel or at an Airbnb? That is the question. Are you going to, are you more apt to stay at a hotel or an Airbnb if you're going to travel at all this summer and your choices are hotel, Airbnb, or you don't plan on traveling just yet? Ken, I want you to guess which uh, people are going to say first, just for fu for fun here. I'm going to say not planning on traveling this summer. Well, you're you're right, but but we can't hear you. But I you did say not travel, right? Over over half. Right, not travel. Right, right. Over half the folks said that they do not plan on traveling just yet. Uh, Seventeen percent said Airbnb. Thirty-one percent said hotel. So I see that there's a lot of work that has to be done. And it's really just too early because we really just don't know where this is all going. I know there's tremendous optimism and I share that optimism, but I think that optimism has to be couched with, with realistic caution from what the medical community is, is telling us. And, and you know, that, that part is not a political process. That's pure science. And, you know, I, I still believe in, in science and I know you do too. And, and, and so I think that's, that's where we get our best information. Let, let's talk, let's go to the next slide, page 18, if you would continue, Ken, please. Also, by the way, I need questions and comments, guys. I'm not sure if we're getting really any. So I, you know, it, it kind of defeats the purpose if, if, if we're not getting questions from, from you all, and I really would appreciate that. Okay, question 18, yeah, uh, page 18. Airbnb is, is uh, and, and private rentals uh, have really been a big driver of the, uh, the residential uh, community uh, or investment community for quite some time, especially in vacation type areas in South Florida, uh, the coast of the Carolinas, et cetera. I've had several people reach out to me over the last week, two weeks about their vacation rentals, what risks that they were facing and what they should be doing. And of course I said, you have to, if you're an Airbnb, you have to follow their regulations. You have to have a, mo a minimum of three days between stays. Uh, and again, going back to where the hotels are at, it's all about cleanliness. I think that's the winner. And if you can price your vacation rental uh, or your Airbnb at a, at a level and give that comfort level that it is absolutely clean, uh, you're going to be okay. But a lot of people bought properties based on having that income stream that right now are going to face a struggle because less people are going to travel. I know a lot of people are itching to get out of their houses. A lot of them will, but uh, back to science, I believe in science and I think we all should as well. A lot of things we don't know yet about coronavirus. How long do we get immunity? How long it takes, how long it'll take to get to herd immunity and how long it's gonna take to get a vaccine, we just don't know yet. I mean, I mean the reality is science got us into this problem. I mean, you know, the technology of the industrial revolution, you know, the way we created energy, I mean, that's all science. It may be old science, but, but science got us into it, and it's going to be science that gets us out of it, and that's the great irony here. It's just a question of how we channel that science, but, but you, know, it, it, you know, whether it is coal burning or other fossil fuel burning or, or the use of our automobiles, that's all technology. It's all science. That's what got us here, and ultimately, that's the, that's the route out. You can't think there's a route out that isn't through the process that you came in. It may be a different way out, but it's still the same continuity of, of, of getting out. 
Um, I do want to mention something about hotels versus, versus uh, Airbnb, and that is many hotels have elevators. And the use of elevators is, is really, really controversial right now. In fact, I heard, and it may just be a rumor, so don't repeat it just yet, but I'm hearing that at the courthouse, and, in, and I won't even say which one, but it's in South Florida, they're thinking of only letting one person in an elevator at a time. If that occurs, I don't know how you have jury trials. I don't know how you even get the lawyers and your witnesses up. I don't know how you even get the judges up. Well, the judges have their own elevators, supposedly. But the, the problem is, is you can't really run a courthouse that way. And you really can't run a hotel that way. And so the question is, and most people are saying that, you know, there shouldn't be more than a few people in an elevator at a time. They have to be wearing masks. If someone was in an elevator that wasn't masked, you should step out. I mean, do you aerate the elevator each time it's used? I mean, the problem is it's a very enclosed container. And so uh, the load of the virus, depending on what floor you're on, could, could be rather high if you're on a high floor and it stops and goes out. Of course, if it opens, the doors open a lot, there, there's air pressure that comes out that, that pulls the air out. But if that doesn't happen, you know, you, you could have issues and, and you literally have to wear a mask and make sure that other people are wearing a mask when you're, when you're in an elevator. We do have some questions. Ken, we're going to go, let, let, why don't you comment on that and then we'll go to the first question. Yeah, you have two, you have two traffic jams, especially in the large buildings that have vertical transportation, you know, calling 10 to 50 or 100 floors, especially in the, in the big city centers. It'll take you a half hour, hour to get to work and then you're going to have another 45 minutes to an hour in the lobby waiting to get to your floor. Right. And some of these older buildings have sky lobbies, which means you have to take an elevator to get to the lobby to take another elevator to get where you're going. So it just doesn't work yet today until we figure it out. It's going to Oops. At the office market in those downtown high rise buildings is under severe pressure right now. Right. To figure that out. We, we got, Ken, we got a question here, which I think I'm going to try and answer. Uh, it's from a, a fellow lawyer and friend. Uh, what liability, uh, uh, who exactly doesn't believe in science, uh, I guess is the question. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not going to answer that. So uh, it seems like a rhetorical question of, of, of sorts. So I won't, I won't, 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 won't even try and entertain that. Um, but, but this is another good question. What liability does a business owner have if a customer or employee of a restaurant gets COVID? Is there insurance to cover it? And then is the owner of a retail business potentially liable if a customer does not wear a mask and another customer gets COVID. We're actually going to address how that exactly happens and works. And we have some, some, some examples of, of some experiments and some studies of, of how people in restaurants and other parts of the world did get COVID. But in terms of employees, typically if an employee gets hurt or sick on the job, that's typically covered by workers' comp insurance. Uh, and so uh, in terms of employees, I, I think that that's not necessarily always going to be the issue, but you still could have uh, landlord liability issues because employees of, of buildings can sometimes not just sue their employer, but they can also sue the owner of, of, of a building if the building didn't take proper precautions. In terms of customers, we talked about last week that it's going to be a little bit uh, like getting uh, food poisoning, and you'd have to prove that you know, you're not the only one who just happened to get sick because then you can't prove that, that you got sick at that particular location. But if there's a cluster of where you went as a customer, uh, it could be a hairstylist, could be a restaurant, and a whole bunch of people got sick at the same time, uh, there's gonna be overwhelming evidence that it occurred at that location. And then we're gonna have to figure out how that happened and, and if the uh, employer or the, or the purveyor of, of the establishment took proper necessary precautions that a reasonable person would do so that they weren't uh, falling below the standard of care, which is typically called negligence. Next question, or, or let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is kind of interesting for travel. It, you know, this is the CDC telling you to get travel insurance. I think that's really hysterical. I don't know if the travel insurance was, was, was lobbying the CDC, but the great irony is most of these travel insurance policies are going not to cover COVID related events. And why is that? Because you, but the definition of insurance is to happen to an event that is unforeseeable in the sense that you didn't know it was happening. It's not a pre-existing condition. So you can't insure something that's pre-existing because that's not insurance, that's indemnity, but it's not insurance. And an insurance policy is supposed to insure you for an accident. Well, if the accident already has occurred, then how are you going to get insurance to cover that? And so uh, rest assured that these new policies are not going to cover this pandemic. Will they cover future pandemics that aren't on the horizon? Maybe, but I think a lot of people, and I've read an article, I think it was in the Times or Wall Street Journal over the weekend, that suggested that people are not going to be buying this insurance anymore because they're so disappointed by the coverage, they're so disappointed by the service, they're so disappointed by the wait time, they're so disappointed with the reimbursement policies, and so many people did not get what they, what, what, what they bargained for. What's interesting is that the uh, uh, 
cruise lines are actually offering different kinds of reimbursement plans in terms of cancellation insurance, because a lot of this has to do with cancellations. Uh, and they're providing their own cancellations without insurance now, and, and the airlines are doing the same. So, so I, I wouldn't want to be betting on, on, on the, the longevity of travel insurance unless they reinvent themselves. Of course, they're also saying watch your health for, for fever, cough, and trouble breathing, and if you get sick, call it, anyway, this is, this is what your CDC is, is, is telling you. I mean, anyway, I'm not going to comment on this. Let's go to the next slide. It's ridiculous. Okay. Uh, New trends of travel. Uh, Ken, why don't you talk about that on page 20, please? Yeah, uh, back to uh, uh, health and safety. I mean, again, everything's changing. Uh, less people flying in airplanes, more people uh, getting in the car uh, because it's uh, uh, perceived to be safer. Um, I think uh, the new luxury is really going to be health and safety. And I think you'll see the major brands rolling out uh, sort of uh, a uh, 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 an arms race related to cleaning. Uh, they're going to come out with new advertising related to what kind of cleaning uh, systems they're using and, and how sanitized their rooms are, and you know how many nights uh, of of dormancy each each room has between guests. And, you know that's uh, that's going to be the name of the game. And what I'm also, if I may, what I'm also hearing is that there could be third parties, like like a good housekeeping seals of approval, you know, on products that used to have the good housekeeping seal of approval. Sure. You may have third parties that are going to assess the sanitation and disinfectant processes of each major uh, uh, hotel chain to determine if, in fact, they meet certain levels and standards. And so that's going to be very, very interesting to see, and as opposed to them just making claims that aren't necessarily accurate or, or, or provable. Uh, next slide. Let's go on. 21. Welcome back to the future. You, that's, that's yours, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually not a picture of me in that chair. Uh, sipping, I think he's sipping wine. Um, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of RV travel, but you're going to see the RV uh, industry explode in a positive way. And you're going to see a lot of people um, uh, hitting the road and uh, and doing it this way. I, you know, I, I all I can say is that it's it's not for me. But but it is for some people. And if you are an it's RV, it's going to be for some people because especially the the demographic of the people that buy RVs are going to be the ones that are most susceptible to COVID and and uh, that are that have the ability and the uh, financial wherewithal to deploy money into, uh, into our owning RVs and also the rental market's gonna increase. Right, well, I was gonna mention that most people really aren't buying RVs. Most people like rent an RV for a week, two or three weeks. I mean, that's, most of the RVs on the road are actually rented. Most people don't know that. That's right, but, you, but again, there's, there's dealerships even locally that, um, that are doing quite well. And I think you're gonna see this, it's, it's gonna be more of that bunker mentality. Right. Where people are going to say, okay, I'm going to get on the road, but I'm going to be a, a road warrior in my, in my own urban combat vehicle. <laughs> anyway, we, we got to push on here. Or we're going to end up roll, uh, rolling over for our third week. Okay, let's talk about restaurants here. Uh, as you all know, restaurants are operating at 25% capacity. Uh, you got the minimum uh, requirements of six feet. And, uh, you know, we uh, you know, can only have parties of less than 10. Tables and other, other areas should be cleaned and disaffected. Preference for paper menus, reservation only model recommended, outdoor dining preferred, bar areas closed, no self service here. Uh, this, this picture is great. I think it's uh, from somewhere uh, in Holland, I believe, and they've created these little glass huts. The question is do you have to clean the glass each time because people's breath and, and sneezes all condense on the glass? And then the question is are those surfaces that, that need to be cleaned? So it's, so it's kind of interesting, or do you aerate them? But, it, but I mean, it's a cute little concept. Uh, let, me, let me go to the next question, if, if I may. Uh, it's a question uh, in. Uh, uh, concerning, uh, assuming you're going to go to a restaurant, are you willing to eat inside, just outside, or take out? That is the question, and people already have, have responded, and the answer is right here, okay? Uh, inside, 4%, outside, uh, 45%, take out only 35%, don't plan to eat out at all, 28%. Okay, so, so it looks like about 38% are going to uh, are willing to do takeout outside over almost half, inside not many, 3%, and don't plan to eat out at all. So in terms of not, not eating, if people are willing to just eat inside, not out, and don't plan to eat out at all, you're at, you're at 31%. But outside, about half of us are, are willing to eat outside, 
and take out only about a third. So um, I think the folks who have inside spaces are going to have to reassess those. I think we talked about last week that New York City is talking about closing major streets and turning those streets into like the Rambla uh, in, in, in Spain, in, in, in Barcelona, where, where literally you'll have just enough spacing for people to walk around and, and eat and eat outside. And that, that should be interesting. That, that also goes for, for bicycles and, 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 and scooters that are going to be used in, in, in the city. And so we're going to see the reinvention of the city. We're going to see reinvention of, of city space and, 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 and urban spaces. Um, but the real question is, uh, you know, how many folks are just going to give up on that model and just move to the burbs, which of course is going to be good for the realtors who, who, who are selling houses uh, out, out here. Uh, Next slide, uh, uh, slide 24. Okay, actually slide 23 is really an interesting slide. We talked about this. This is a study, I forgot where this was. It says Seattle and King County. So it must've been somewhere somewhere out west in, in uh, the state of Washington. Um, and what we're seeing is, is if, if we take the cursor, we're seeing that right here is the air conditioner unit, this black thing on the right here. Excuse me, can you get right here? There we go. The air blew that way, blew from uh, right to left. And what we're seeing is, is that, move those pictures please, uh, is that uh, the folks with dark, uh, were red, got the COVID right. So the source of outbreak was, was the individual here. Everyone else with the, with, the, with the red circles also got it. If you follow the airflow, you'll see that the people with, with the white circles who were at the restaurant type did not get sick, but we're seeing that the airflow actually was responsible for, for getting a lot of people sick uh, at that one restaurant. And so airflow is gonna be really important. And of course, if we go to the next slide, uh, this may help a little bit, these plastic dividers, um, you know, between tables. And um, I'm, I'm just not sure if, if how effective that would be necessarily if you're going to be somewhere for a long time. A problem, again, is the load. How much are you going to absorb from an individual if, if they're shedding the, the virus? And the question is, you know, is it just going to be for 10 minutes or is it going to be for an hour and a half? And so if you're outdoors, the likelihood is that, that uh, it would disperse sufficiently and, and you wouldn't have to be dealing with these issues. We have another question. No matter what they do in a restaurant, they cannot control germs. They're kidding themselves. What about a $3 per hour employee constantly touching and readjusting a mask and touching your, your metal silverware, dish cups, et cetera? We're moving way too fast. Numbers are going to spike very shortly. This is nuts. Um, you know, that's, that's a very realistic opinion. I'm not gonna say you're right or you're wrong. Um, that's an individual question. Um, obviously, these people normally make more than three dollars an hour because of because of tips. Um, but it's 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 going to be a, a tough question, and and it really just depends on whether or not you have the antibodies. Because if you have the antibodies, maybe you're willing to to eat in. And if enough of us have the antibodies, if if we hit 50, 55 percent, half of us could go out to eat and not really worry about these things. So I think it's all going to depend on whether you have pre-existing conditions how old you are, how you feel good about yourself. I mean, there are just a lot of questions here. And, and un, until we, we get a, a, a vaccine, I, I think it's, it's all going to be touch and go. And, and while you're very strident about your opinion, there are other people who may feel that they're willing to take that risk at this point in, in, in their life. Now, let's talk about, if we can, uh, retail spaces. Let's go to page 26. Ken, let's talk about malls a little bit. Okay. Okay, well, actually, uh, and, 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 let me, and, and let me see, I have, what's this question? Uh, oh, okay. Let's talk about malls, and then we're going to have a question. So you, you go first. Okay, malls, um, enclosed malls, um, probably dead uh, as we understand them today. I think there'll be a couple of outliers, like uh, locally, like um, Aventura Mall, given the uh, the population that surrounds it, and that it's in Miami. They get a lot of uh, international visitor, visitors, but I think the whole mall game is going to change. Most malls are going to fail. They're going to have to be repurposed or, or demolished uh, in the land, re, you know, used for something else. Um, you well, know, or you I could have like, or, or forgive me, or you could have like the Sawgrass, which has a very out, of, uh, you know, half of the malls now an outside mall. Then you got the right. inside mall. It's conceivable they could repurpose the inside mall as an outside mall too. Well, yeah, that's just going to require significant amounts of capital expenditure. Right. Uh, I think no matter what, in order for people to feel comfortable going. Uh, into any retail store, even if it's an outdoor mall that you have to walk inside because that's how, you know, how they work, you're still facing the same issues. And I think retail in general is under uh, tremendous pressure because uh, it was before because of the internet and e-commerce. Now, specifically, only the strong are going to survive. Uh, most department stores are done. Uh, they're going to continue to fall. And it's just not how people shop anymore. And uh, pretty soon you're going to be able to 
stand in front of your mirror, get scanned for your dimensions, and you'll be able to order, you know, whatever you want. But, let, but let's be clear, these trends already laid their seeds before this crisis. And that's right. And that this, is an excel, this is an accelerant that, you know, what's happening now is an accelerant for so many trends related to the office market, working from home, all those types of things were basically uh, 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 pushed push much, much faster, maybe a decade faster than, than what was yeah. expected. So, so let's see if people agree with what you're saying here to some extent. This is about malls. Have you been to the mall or do you plan to go to the mall during the next, the, during the next week? 7% uh, have been, 86% have not been, and 7% are unsure. I mean, so maybe, maybe, you, maybe you, you had a cheat sheet and you, and you saw the responses already, but, but you're, yeah. you're absolutely correct. I mean, you're, you're, the seeds have been sown here. I, I want to go back to one thing that, that one of, our, uh, one of uh, uh, the people that are watching talked about the restaurants. And I believe um, they commented last week about the cruise lines and safety and cleanliness. And I think going back to that chart that you showed, uh, regarding airflow, it's very, very important that we understand that even if you're outside, it does not protect you if someone's sneezing or coughing. There's still a dispersal pattern of, of uh, whether it's flu or whether it's COVID, you know, you really have to be far apart from people, even if you're going to be outside. But, but, but we are seeing, time. right, but what we are okay. seeing is that in some Asian, you know, uh, nations, where they have historically been wearing face masks for years and that it was culturally accepted for a long period of time, that their numbers are way, way down. And we are constantly seeing that had we been wearing an air, a mask here in this country earlier in this process, in January already, or even in December, our numbers would be probably closer down by about 80% is what, is what the scientists are suggesting. I mean, so that is what it is. And the question is, you know, we just have to culturally adapt uh, for, the unforeseeable future is what it sounds like to me. Uh, right. Well, Bloomberg reported either last night or this morning that uh, in north, northern China, they just uh, shut down about 100 million people uh, related to uh, increase in, in uh, COVID cases. So and, there is ro there's rolling um, quarantines now back in China. And you are going to have flare-ups. There's another question here. Uh, some soldiers off the Navy carrier with antibodies were reinfected, according to CNN. This is a big question now. Are you gentlemen planning on going out just out of curiosity? Uh, in terms of, of the reinfection, you know, we're not doctors, we're not scientists, but there are conflicting reports. I think it's going to also depend on the strain of the virus you get. Will that particular strain, you know, give you the same antibodies? There are numerous strains out there. Um, Ken, do you want to add to that in terms of antibodies and, and, and you know, herd immunity? Well, it's a great question. Uh, you're right. The problem is, is there's multiple strains. Uh, the testing that we have is just not accurate. Uh, it just isn't. And those sailors specifically uh, may have had low loads of virus particles in their body when they were tested negative. And, you know, for, they could have still had the virus at the time that they tested negative. Now, my wife, who's a nurse and an educator, uh, has colleagues that are on the ground in hospitals in New York City that are caring for COVID patients that caught it, recovered, and then caught it again. So that is possible. And keep in mind that frontline healthcare workers are being bombarded with with virus particles in their you know their their work lives. So okay. it's different from us just going out to the mall or going out to a restaurant or going to Walgreens to pick up pres prescriptions, you know, it, it's much, it's much different. Yeah, so in, in terms, of, care, second, so in terms of the second question, would, is your family planning on venturing out into a mall? That's the question that, that someone asked us. What, it, it's a yes or a no, you know, in the next seven days. Absolutely not. Okay. And, and I generally don't go to malls. My kids order stuff on Amazon for us and, or we do it. So I'm, I'm content not, not going inside a mall. Going inside a shop to pick something up real quick, that, that's a different story, I think. But again, it's how long you're going to be inside you know, a, a place that, that, that could have the virus and what your load is going to be. So it, it, if I don't have to do it, I don't think I would do it in the next week. Um, page 27 here, uh, plexiglass, that's going to be the name of the game across the board. 
migration to automation is the objective, minimization of time of shopping experience, like we're talking about, use of apps and websites as, as the new window shopping, no kids in the shopping experience, major repurposing of space and use. Ken, you can address that for a second. Retails and re restaurants that we talked about face huge objectives. New objectives is cleanliness, safety, and reliability. Uh, but I think we kind of addressed what, what, where this is all going. These are just cool pictures of, of what it, it looks like if you are shopping. Just go back one second. Um, you know, I haven't necessarily seen this up firsthand. I don't really think I'm missing much, but it is kind of fascinating. The next page I kind of like because you're seeing all the plexiglass uh, that's, that's being set up between uh, you and the cashier to protect the, uh, the cashiers as, as, as much as, as possible. Clean, automatic, integrated with e-commerce, fast in, fast out, offers COVID-19 resources and price. I mean, I kind of like the pickup experience where you order the stuff, they bring it out to you, they put it in your car. I mean, I kind of like that. I mean, I think it's a great, <laughs> I mean, I could live with that for the rest of my life, quite frankly. Um, how about you? What do you say, Ken? Yeah, I was at Home Depot yesterday. Uh, they're a uh, can't hear you. Can't hear. You. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we went to Home Depot yesterday after going to the grocery store, and Home Depot really has it down. Where it, you know, they've got someone who's tracking you and said, "Okay, you wait there, and you can go to the the checkout, the self service checkout." It was very, very distant. I mean, not six feet, more like eighteen feet. Um, and I think that's going to be the new normal, but going back to CapEx, it's going to be unbelievably expensive to implement all of the changes that are necessary. You, you know, you can't put plexiglass up or, or plastic sheeting up everywhere. You know, there's also fire code considerations. It just, it, it's just a, a cascade effect of, uh, of expense. So keep that in mind. It's going to take time. No, I appreciate that. I, I want to go on to uh, the next subject, uh, schools and colleges, as, as we prepare for the, the question of our kids are going to go back to college and, and certainly uh, what's going to happen to school in the fall. Um, students and parents, uh, professors express their wishes and worries. Parents are not going to play games with the lives of their children, one reader says. Uh, and here we have, you know, the, this COVID curve. It looks like a, <laughs> like a ski slope or something. And, uh, you know, that's the big question of what, what parents are going to do going, going forward. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I want to read the, this next poll after we go through these slides. Apart from liability connected to transmission of the virus, colleges face liability connected with tuitions and fees. Many schools are being sued because the online experience isn't the same, plus they haven't returned necessarily all the fees for, for, for room and board. And is it fair to pay the full cost of tuition when you're not getting uh, the same experience as, as having a professor live who has office hours and speaking to your classmates and doing stuff together collaboratively. And then is out of state or even out of the city colleges worth it, worth the money when students are not even out of their, 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 their rooms when they were in, in high school. And then the, the real question is to gap year or not gap year, which brings us to the next question actually. Uh, if you have a college bound child, assuming that the college is physically gonna open in the fall, are you more apt to have your child attend school or take a gap semester or gap year. And uh, seven, 12 percent said that they would send their kids. Uh, almost 60 percent are saying that they would want their kid to take a gap year and 29 percent want to say unsure because they want to see what it's going to look like as we get closer. I think the 29 percent is probably sensible but the folks who don't want to send their kids and have their kids do something else for a year is, is equally sensible. Uh, to attend, you know, I, I think there's a gamble there. Um, I, I did do a, a little study of what my own alma mater, Princeton University, did in 1918 and 1919 during the uh, during the Spanish flu, and I wanted to see if they closed or what they did. And they uh, they 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 basically implemented quarantine and isolation. And unfortunately, a number of students did did perish. They may have well perished had they stayed home, um, but they did have a number of deaths today in our society with the tort system the way we are and with lawyers like myself or my colleagues, that's probably not what any school wants to have happen because uh, they just don't want that on their, on, on their hands. And, and that's why they sent the kids home uh, this past spring. And that's why if they don't send them back, it would be for that very reason. Back in 1918, 1919, these colleges probably could have a few students pass away on their campuses. Today, that's probably an untenable um, prospect. What do you, do you agree with that, Ken? Yeah, I have a 17 year old. Uh, he's entering 12th grade. Uh, and, uh, we're yeah, yeah. About 
potentially doing a back a, uh, a gap year. Right. And uh, it's really a function of, of what if he takes a gap year, where is he going to go anyway? Right. Um, you know, and this is another accelerant of the impact that uh, the re return on investment that higher education has been having a hard time showing. Um, most people are not going to want to send their kids online to Yale or Princeton uh, or any other Ivy League and spend seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, be, you know, to attend online. There's no value in it. So it's a real problem. And uh, I keep hoping my son will go to Alaska and work on one of those deadliest cash boats, you know, and make some money. But I, his his mother is kind of you know attached to him, so I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, we're going to proceed here because I know uh, people want me to get through these slides. At least, I, at least I'm going to do my best this time around. A secondary school, it looks like public schools will resume next, next year. Unclear how they will accommodate the requirements of six feet when in most schools that's almost impossible. Most likely there'll be no sports, at least fall and winter semesters. And if there is, there certainly won't be allowed spectators. The next question is how to evaluate uh, the, the slide of academic standards. And, and, and there is going to be a problem with that, you know, and that, and that could be a generational crisis. Uh, Students should, should, uh, uh, should all students retake the last quarter or the previous grade? I guess that's a question. And then should standardized testing uh, take, um, take the pandemic into the equation in, and somehow be curved and evaluated? These are all questions that I- They are. Uh, yeah, and they're, they're good questions. I think they are. Right. Uh, we have a question here. What rights do employees have if they're not yet comfortable returning to an office environment, especially if they have pre-existing health conditions? Do they just resign? You know, that's a very good question. If you have a pre-existing condition, you probably are going to be protected uh, by uh, Americans with the Disability Act, the ADA, because you, you, you have something that makes you vulnerable. And so employers historically and typically need to provide reasonable accommodations. In some cases, that's just impossible. For example, if you're a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant and, you're going, and that's your job and you don't want to come back, you can't remotely serve the food. It's not possible. Maybe they could put you in a different position in the restaurant, possibly, where you're not exposed to as many people, but you would either have to take a furlough or leave of absence or find a position that, that is going to protect yourself. But the employer doesn't have an obligation to keep you hired when the job you were hired for always had the inherent risk that you were going to be coming in contact with the public. And so that's a, a tough question. In terms of office workers, if you can remotely work from home, and, and can do that, then there could be some requirements or some accommodation that an employer could, could provide to you. Going back to schooling, we're seeing here what, what schooling's possibly gonna look like with, with again, this plexiglass. And um, it's not what the, the way we left the classroom, but it, it is kind of like how it's gonna look. It's the same thing with casinos. They're gonna have these plexiglass little cubbies for people who are gonna be playing poker or, 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 uh, or blackjack when, when the casinos re reopen. I want to go over the revised CDC guidelines. These are the things that, that employers need to be conscious about and make sure that you, you're monitoring these things and that you understand them and that you're working with, with your, your lawyers and, and your advisors to make sure that you're, you're doing the right thing and it, both for yourself, your clients, and, and, your, and, your, and your customers. Um, should you consider opening? Uh, will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Are you ready to protect employees at the highest risk for severe illness? If there's no, do not open. Uh, our recommended health and safety actions in place, we can, these details are available on the site if you wanna look, uh, but the answer is you need to meet the safeguards first, meet the safeguards first, um, and you have to continually monitor your employees. Next. Uh, for restaurants, uh, we kind of talked about what's gonna need to be done, but making sure that they don't have fever, making sure that they're, they're not sick, making sure you're pro providing proper spacing, proper ventilation, that, that you're using paper, paper menus, these are all the kinds of things that you're going to have to do uh, if you want to be open. And of course, in, in, in most of the country, you can only even be open only 25% indoors. And so it's, it's gonna be a challenge and, it, and, and um, you know, it's, it's just gonna be tough. Uh, I wanna go over some liability guidelines now from, from uh, the Cleveland Clinic because they've provided some excellent, excellent uh, slides here that, that we thank them for, for sharing with us. Um, if we go to the bottom here and we take a look, you know, you have these, these cloth masks that, that prevent some of these, these uh, virus balls, which of course we can't see, but they're, but they're actually visualizing them. And that's your first uh, zone of defense. Then social distancing is your second. Cleaning and, and disinfecting is your third. And then hand washing is the fourth. So if we think of it as the, what they call the Swiss cheese model. You're seeing that each layer prevents less and less virus balls from coming through. And at the end, 
one sneaks through, two sneak through, two can't sneak through, one sneaks through, and then finally your hand washing is your final line of defense. And so that's, it, it's kind of interesting to visualize it that way, and hopefully that will stick with you at the end of this, this webinar today. Uh, the usual recommendations, I, I, you know, I'm not gonna be your mother here and tell you what you have to do, but these are ironically things we were all taught when we were in kindergarten, interestingly. And so, you know, we really kind of have to go back there. The face mask, of course, maybe wasn't, although we used to like to wear masks. Uh, cover your mouth and nose, you know, don't use your hands, you know, because that's ridiculous to use your hands when you, when you sneeze. Practice social distancing, wash your hands, avoid care facilities, clean and disinfect, stay home when sick, maintain healthy habits. I mean, these are all things that are somewhat common sense, but we need to do those. Uh, screening, we need to learn to use these, these uh, uh, head, head thermometers. Uh, I don't think they're hard to use, but we need to start to learn to use them. Employees must check themselves before they, they go to work. Some employers may decide that they want to check their employees when they come to work. Obviously, if someone's sick, they cannot come to work, and you have to literally enforce social spacing. Next. Clean and disinfect, plan, implement, and maintain. Very specific guidelines. It's, it's nothing really new here, but th these are things that we all have to do if we're going to be uh, responsible employers. Next. Uh, safe six away away, you know, stay six feet away from everyone. We have to really try and enforce that both for our employees as well as, as our customers. What symptoms should I be watching for on my workforce? Cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, muscle pain, never, uh, never lo lo new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, and other less common symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and in, in older folks I hear also a disorientation may be a, a new symptom that, that we need to look for. Um, how do employees stay well? Well, we want to keep the stress down if we can, good exercise, healthy diet, remaining connecting with others, taking breaks, and getting enough sleep. And uh, the healthy diet is, is so critical here. And that would mean, you know, we're not smoking too much, not drinking too much, and, and really trying to uh, keep the weight off also because uh, that, that's so important to this, this whole process. Okay, so the next tenant we talked about is insurance. So if you're gonna open up, you need to make sure you have good liability insurance. That's the insurance you're gonna to need to make sure that if someone does get sick, typically a, a customer, that you have insurance. If they're an employee, they'll, they'll typically, hopefully be covered by workers' comp. Uh, there are sometimes any exclusions and exceptions to that, so we, we need to look at that, and your lawyers need, need to look at that. And in terms of, of be, being open here, you have someone who's a, you know, um, cutting hair, he's a barber, and, and you know, is he employing the necessary uh, requirements to keep his customers safe? And hopefully he is, and, and of course himself safe. And of course the reason we talked about the safety guidelines is because those will be the standard by which lawyers will look at to determine if you met the standard of care and were you negligent or did you fall below the standard of negligence. And, and negligence will be, will be based on what this, the community standard is. Were you doing something below the standard that the rest of the community was doing? Is, is this gentleman doing uh, you know, the same amount of, of cleanup that the average barber in his community is, is doing. Um, I've been asked, are there any other questions as I proceed here? Because this is a really important area and I, I, and I really want to make sure that everyone understands that this insurance coverage is really important. I also want to talk about the importance of umbrella insurance coverage. That's personal liability coverage. So if your company gets sued and there's not enough insurance and they can pierce the corporate veil, that you have enough personal insurance so that your personal assets are not exposed to a liability forcing you then to have your business uh, file for some sort of chapter 11, which we'll talk about next week again, or a sub chapter five in chapter 11 bankruptcy and makes you insolvent. I mean, the most unfortunate thing is that here you are trying to protect your business and reopen and reestablish it. And that very act is the act that causes you to lose your business because you end up uh, being too aggressive, too anxious, or you get some overzealous customer who, who's trying to, to somehow take advantage of, of, of the situation. Uh, and in that sense, if, assuming you do have an, don't have enough insurance, and assuming you do get sued, we need to make sure that your final line of defense is asset protection. And as we've talked about in the past, how you title your, your property, whether it's your stock, whether it's your bank accounts, whether it's your home, there are different ways to title your property, and you want to make sure that you title it correctly. If you are married, uh, typically married couples will title their, their property uh, with, uh, by tenants by the entirety. And that means that when one spouse dies, uh, the other spouse will end up getting everything. And unless they both get sued for the same liability, uh, they will in fact not be able, they being the individual who's suing you, will not be able to attach that asset. If, you, if your assets are, are held individually, those assets are available to to the, the person who is suing you. If they're held in common 
half of those assets could be available and joint tenancy very similar. Uh, and so the real, the real issue is how do you title those assets and how do you protect those assets? And uh, if it's not clear, most courts will assume it's a tenancy in common. And that means that half of the asset could be uh, available to, to someone who is trying to sue you personally. Um, another thing we need to look at is asset in, in terms of asset protection is how do we put our assets so that they're unavailable to either bankruptcy creditors or to creditors who are, are now suing you because they got hurt at your establishment and because you didn't have insurance. So if you have enough insurance, all these issues may not matter. But if you don't have enough insurance or if your insurance company goes under, and let me tell you that that has happened in my career, that insurance companies have gone under uh, where people thought they had enough liability insurance. And so if the insurance company does go under, then they're gonna be looking at, at your corporate assets. And if those assets are insufficient and they're able to pierce the corporate veil, which they may not be able to, and we'll talk about that some other time, uh, then your personal assets could be available. So we wanna make sure that at the end of the day that your assets are never available under any of these scenarios. And it's kind of like a domino, uh, you know, where one goes down and they keep going down. And so we wanna have break points where not all the dominoes go down. And one of the good break points is to make sure that some of your assets are not available to your creditors. And so, of course, in Florida in particular, 401ks, IRAs, pension plans, those kinds of retirement assets are never available or almost never available to your creditors. Other states, that's not the case. In Florida, it's very protective of, of retirement assets. And uh, so always you should be maximizing your IRA, you should be maximizing your 401k to the, to the extent you can. Uh, and you wanna do that in a way that, that protects those assets so that you are, are not unnecessarily exposed. Uh, gifting strategies, if, you're, if, you, if you have that, that capacity, uh, gifts that are made uh, before you're being sued are, are typically uh, considered uh, un, un, re, re, that you can't undo those kinds of gifts and, and thus uh, those assets could be gifted to children or other, other family members and, and those are irrevocable and, and can't be challenged. Now, if you're making gifts in the middle of a lawsuit, uh, rest assured that those could be deemed uh, as, uh, as fraudulent uh, transfers and thus could be undone. And the fraudulent, not in the sense you're committing a crime, but they're, 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 they're transfers that are not considered to be uh, uh, fair and that, that they can be challenged and, and the assets could be put back into the company or to you individually so that your creditor, the person who's suing you, has, has those available to, to them. So these are all the kinds of things that we do with our, with, with our, with our clients and we want to make sure that you all are well aware of that. Uh, to help you. Okay, very good. And so uh, we did a whole webinar, I think uh, it was number eight, webinar number eight, I believe. Uh, and, and then in there, we had a whole section on asset protection planning, which you're welcome to go back to. And if anyone needs to make an appointment to go over these issues personally, we would be more than pleased to meet with you. If you transfer after an event to protect uh, them, will they be reversed? When do, you when do, do you transfer? Well, you always do a transfer when it's not uh, something that you absolutely have to do to try and prevent someone from suing. So the idea is that you have good asset protection planning and estate planning going on throughout your business life and that you're making sure that these things aren't being done after the fact when you realized you should have done it. And how do you know to do it before? You have people like me telling you, you need to do it before there's a crisis. So if you're a, any establishment owner, you should be making sure that your assets now not when someone finally sues you or you get that lawyer's letter, uh, and that you're doing the right thing for your family and for your future by making sure that your assets are, are properly protected. And then protecting capital investment, uh, is, it, uh, is it time to put cash in, in? Is it time to borrow money? What kind of debt is preferable? What is a personal guarantee? Who should sign? Why, why debtors are asking my spouse to sign? Well, obviously, to the extent possible, you never want your spouse to sign anything, whether it's a mortgage or a guarantee for a business uh, for the simple reason that then both of you are on the hook to the extent that only one of you signs and your assets are held uh, by the entirety, that asset would not be available to that creditor. And that's of course why they want you both to sign, but many times they, they can't legally make the spouse who's not involved in the business sign. If they're involved in the business, they may be able to force them to sign, but if they're not, they, they would not be able to do that. Uh, there are other strategies uh, available in terms of when you're investing in your own business, are you investing cash? Are you investing? Uh, money that you're lending to the business, how do you secure that versus other creditors? And that's something we'll be talking about more with, with Zach Shillamuth next week as we talk about how bankruptcy protective planning uh, can be very important in the, in the time of, of, of COVID. Uh, 
do we have any more questions or, or are we? I think, I think we covered it. Ken, we got two minutes, all yours. Okay. Uh, um, what do you want me to talk about as far as personal guarantees um, as okay. a landlord, a landlord rep? I always ask for it. 100%, yes. But um, I always tell my clients on the tenant uh, user occupier side, always say no to those. Um, you know, I think now uh, is the time to be very, very mindful of your cash flow, conserve as much cash as possible. The future is very uncertain. Uh, I think yesterday's boost in the stock market was great, but it was based on something that may or may not happen. And I think we're in still for very rough water. And don't be surprised to hear some, some pretty rough numbers over the second and third quarter on gross domestic product and how low those numbers, how negative they are. Uh, just remember this is temporary. But now's the time to not make uh, large uh, purchase decisions. And now's the time to sort of circle the wagons. That's my, uh, the advice I'm giving to all my clients. No, and I, and I think that's right. I mean, I think the idea that, that you keep your powder dry and you hope for the best and hope that maybe things are going to get better. But at the same time, uh, there's a realistic uh, scenario where things could get worse uh, this winter when there's both the traditional flu season and this COVID season that get commingled together and where the medical community can't even figure out which is which because many of the symptoms so overlap. Right. Listen to the science. That's really important. And uh, uh, I know our, our, our friend said, who doesn't listen to science? Well, lots of people that I see going to the gyms and going out to, you know, open congregation on the beaches in other states, they're not listening so much to science. And uh, that's, that's not good. Well, you know, to each his own, we're a free country and you can listen to whoever you yep. want to. And that's what makes us great. But that's why we're going to take a bigger hit than some of these other places. Um, right. And it'll help us uh, boost us to herd immunity, you know? Right. Well, that's, and that may be, that may be our, our luck at the very end. Ken, as oh, usual, I, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, the audience, uh, for participating, my, my friends and clients. Uh, as you know, uh, we're here to serve you. If you need our help, please call us. Uh, many of you have done that, and, and, and we, we certainly appreciate trying to help as many people as we, we possibly can. Uh, we've been here for 30 some odd years. We got through the last crisis. Didn't expect to be going through another one, but we were trained for it and, and that's why we're here. So next week, Zoom at noon with uh, Zach Shillamuth as we're talking about how uh, the bankruptcy code can be your friend and how you can do pre-bankruptcy planning just in case things actually don't get better as soon as we hope so that we can prevent this domino effect and build blocks and, and breaks to protect you and your, your family so we can get through this. And when we do come out of it, you're stronger or at least not, not much worse off than when you went into it. So we have, let me see, we do have a few questions here. Let me take those real quick before we end. In the various establishments where I have been with plexiglass protection, I still had to exchange the credit card from the cashier. So it defeats the purpose until the payments can be done differently. Apple Pay, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Apple Pay is gonna be the way, the way, you know, and, and in the future, I don't think we'll, we'll actually physically need to uh, pull out our credit card. And I think some establishments are gonna figure that out or they're just gonna do what, what I do is I just pay over the phone uh, using my cell phone from my car and just pay either before or after. And that, and that works just as well. Uh, what if you hire an employee, an independent contractor? What is our liability situation with that? If you hire an independent contractor and they're not an employee, you may have more liability because they're not covered by workers' comp. Then again, if they have their own insurance, uh, they should be covered by, by that. And so it really depends on uh, how you treat them. But I think at the end of the day, you have an obligation to try and protect them as much as you do an employee. The only difference is you won't have uh, workers' comp to protect you, but you may have their insurance as well as your own insurance to, to protect you if something goes on. When I say your own insurance, liability insurance. Uh, uh, is it easy to pierce the corporate veil for a single member LLC? Single member LLCs have no protection whatsoever. They don't really exist as a legal entity. I don't recommend them. Uh, we don't form them for individuals. And if you have one, I suggest you call us after this so we can restructure that for you and make sure it's not a single member because it, it'll be deemed by Florida courts as, as being a, a see-through entity and provide you no protection. If you ask your employees to come in at different times, is that okay? It's highly recommended. You probably can't have everyone in, in your establishment at, at the same time, because if you do, you probably can't uh, maintain social distancing of six feet unless you have a very big space. So, so you're gonna have to do that. And there's some studies coming out on how that's gonna work and, and how people- normal, staging, uh, yeah. You're it, gonna have different shifts in staging of people. 
right. rotating in and out. And that's also how occupiers are going to be able to take less space because they're going to rotate various, you know, groups through over time during the workday. And if I may add, there are school systems around the world that are now experimenting with with all kinds of staging of people. Kids will come in for a week and then they'll, they'll, they'll stay, they stay home for a week. And so there's a way to actually mathematically figure out how each of those groups remains almost in their own cocoon and, and won't spread it and they themselves will be able to protect and, and, and insulate themselves. So, so we're gonna see a lot of that going forward. And, and as, as that information comes out, we'll share with you how staging is gonna work. Uh, any tips for snowbirds trying to make a strong argument to be a Florida resident? Yeah, just stay down here and make sure you're here enough days. And if you do, then just just do it. it it's no, and, no taxes, no state taxes. Uh, you know, it's make a great sure you, place to live. Right, but make sure you register your cars and you register to vote here and get get a library card. But you're going to have to establish that that you truly are down here, and then you can go back up north for you know two three months a year. You know when you when when it's easy. But the idea that you're going to be flying back and forth like you used to, uh, those days are are are, are kind of gone for the time being. When they come back. I, I, I can't tell you, and if you want to drive back and forth, that's probably going to be a better, a better route. Last question here, and uh, can you claim Florida Homestead as a renter in Florida? Uh, no, you can't because you're not a property owner. So, so Florida Homestead is only for, for owners of, of homes, not, not, not renters, at least not yet. Uh, I think one more, okay. Uh, is, are all the properties and accounts under a trust are all protected? Uh, um, is all the properties and accounts that are under a trust, uh, Tough question because we don't know if it's an irrevocable trust or revocable trust. So the answer is, uh, I can't answer that question without much more detail. Uh, we are over our limit here. Ken, thank you again. My partners and colleagues at, at Oppenheim Law, thank you. And of course, Weston Title, I, I don't always mention Weston Title, but, but we're open, we're, we're, we're helping people buy and sell homes uh, and keeping them safe through, through remote, remote notarization and mobile notarization. We're not sticking people in rooms for any extended period of time or at all. And, and not making people ride elevators, uh, we're making sure that, that our clients are, are safe and that we're, we're practicing what, what we preach. So Zoom at noon, see you next week. Roy Oppenheim from the trenches. Thank you so much. Stay safe, God bless.